I'm uh, Alex Brickoff, and I'm your host tonight. Tonight, we've got Russ Segner here. Well, thank you, Alex, and good evening, everyone. Many of you have been to by DuPont. Very few of you have probably stopped there on your way south to Olympia. Anyway, uh, DuPont is a little, is a really old town on the water south of uh, Tacoma and uh, just north of the Nisqually Delta, north of I-5. And the reason DuPont exists is back at the turn of the century in 1906, they built a dynamite factory here. Up until that time, most of the logging and mining and uh, construction work was handled in a very primitive way with nitroglycerin and black powder, which were both very dangerous explosives. So the DuPont company from back east uh, built a plant here with access to the water uh, so that they could ship product all over the Northwest, uh, up and down Puget Sound. They shipped down to California and all the way up to Alaska. Here is the orientation of the plant. I-5 is comes right through here. And over here is the water side where there was a wharf. And we'll be taking a look at that. Here's the, here's the location of the wharf. And the trackage comes up here, up to the top. And then this is the main plant and the little museum that we would you would visit there today is uh, right in here. The, tra the plant was also served by the Northern Pacific, which is that trackage that runs along I-5 uh, down toward Olympia. And uh, it fed uh, standard gauge material into the plant uh, for the manufacturing of the, of the explosives. <clears throat> There must have been four or five miles of trackage inside the plant, handling the materials amongst the buildings. And then uh, when they were completely packaged up, they were either shipped out by rail on the NP or down uh, the trackage that goes down the canyon, down to the wharf and shipped, uh, put on freighters and shipped up and down Puget Sound. In the 60s, the plant closed down and DuPont sold the property, put, put it on the market, and Weyerhaeuser bought it. Weyerhaeuser wanted to have better access to the water, and they thought they could access uh, the um, water for shipment of logs to Japan. Uh, and they acquired this property from Weyerhaeuser, about a thousand acres. And uh, everything was all ready to, to go as they were preparing to, all the buildings had been demolished and, and moved away. And the federal government changed the rules with regard to export of logs. So you no longer can ship raw logs to Japan. They had to be manufactured here and then shipped uh, to Japan. So <clears throat> Weyerhaeuser bought this property and had no use for it. Well, the, fortunately, they had an arm called Quadrant Corporation that develops housing and shopping centers and, and uh, business parks. And so they <clears throat> handled the redevelopment of this property into a planned unit development, brand new city, still named DuPont and it's adjacent to the original town site. All of the elements of the dynamite factory were removed, except for a few that still exist. And part of the property has been redeveloped into a golf course, and that's what this is all about. But they left a few remnants uh, in place as sort of artifacts and visual reminders of what was there. And here's, for instance, a piece of trackage that's going in between two large concrete structures. I suspect some of you know a little bit about dynamite or manufacturing of explosives, but many of the structures had walls that were uh, basically uh, concrete or, or big earthen berms on one or both sides, and the front wall and the back wall were designed to uh, be blast exits for explosives as uh, if, if they had an explosion and it would not... Um, uh, detonate all the rest of the adjoining buildings. And I think that's probably a good idea. Anyway, this is part of the uh, the remnant there. Uh, there are a couple of others we'll see a little later uh, out amongst the golf course, uh, which I don't have slides here, but I have another uh, piece of uh, photograph of some of the trackage we'll be visiting. They had a number of uh, locomotives uh, types to work in the plant. These are a gasoline or de uh, fired uh, uh, locomotive, uh, a little bit of a Chrysler or a Buick 
a V8 engine in it. And uh, you can see this little uh, projection on the front. This was to um, facilitate movement of the cars around some very sharp curves. There was a drawbar here that comes through and then can slide quite a, across the width of this, which lets them turn a pretty sharp radius and a little narrow wheelbase on, on the locomotive. It was three foot gauge, which is intriguing to me, and um, was modeled after a plant that they had built back in Pennsylvania. They had, as I mentioned, several different locomotives. This is a, 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 a different type, of course, and I'm assuming it's a, an aspirated engine uh, with the tank on top. Uh, they also had a number of battery operated locomotives as, as well as uh, 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 units that were charged with compressed air. The one remaining locomotive other than those uh, Brookvilles, uh, the yellow locomotive, is this guy, a 12 ton Plymouth. That's diesel fire, fired. And this still exists at the museum and uh, is operable. And we'll get a look at it uh, a little later. But very interesting little locomotive and uh, would make a terrific model. Uh, nobody's built a model of this that I'm uh, commercially. Uh, big, an easy one to modify with from, uh, there's an 18 ton Plymouth manufactured by AccuCraft, but you'd have to shorten it and modify the, the superstructure quite a bit. Notice on the side, the spark arresters um, pretty substantial effort to eliminate any kind of a ignition source in and around uh, a locomotive, uh, a dynamite factory. A lot of really interesting uh, rolling stock. And this is a typical boxcar. Uh, these were roughly 22 feet long. Uh, rode on looks like, I think, 10 ton trucks, arch bars. And they each had a platform at the end. There's a brakeman would operate from this end or the other end. And uh, these all uh, uh, <clears throat> could set the brakes or retard the brakes. But you'll notice there's two sets of, air, of airlines here. They had uh, both straight air and uh, uh, ultimately the Westinghouse uh, mechanisms on them. A nifty little piece of rolling stock, curved roof. The roof on these were all corrugated iron uh, siding, just like uh, siding. And then uh, vertical siding here that uh, had sort of a, a, a beaded uh, a pattern to it. Very, very simple. Here's one of them that remains. And this was, they salvaged when they tore the plant down. They uh, sold off an awful lot of the stuff for uh, storage buildings, tool sheds, chicken coops, and so on. And a lot of the, the, freight, the uh, flat cars and so on uh, were just scrapped. But this guy remained <clears throat> together with a, a steel framed flat car and a wooden framed flat car. Uh, and these are both, are all three part of the collection that they have today. And we'll see these a little bit later. Initially in the 60s, uh, the Fort Lewis uh, Army Engineers Battalion there assisted in the movement of all of this material from the site, uh, some of which was on the Fort Lewis site actually. Uh, as it expanded, and they moved these over to a uh, the storage and display building uh, at the museum. We'll see that a little later. I like this shot is uh, only is really important to me only because it is the only one we have that I have, which shows the uh, logo on the side of the car um, here and uh, gives an indication of of how it was lettered. This is a variation on the same car. The first ones I showed you are an outside sheathed car, and these are an inside sheathed car and a very simple construction. These uh, vertical elements all are uh, mortise and tenon into a, a, a plate here along the, the, um, the bottom of the basic cabin. And this would be just a flat car and you'd put the, uh, the plate on here and then you'd uh, mortise and tenon, uh, these vertical elements into it. And that's going to be important because when we get to working on rebuilding one of these cars, this top section will just lift right off and a very simple construction. 
This is back in, in the East Coast. Then this is a, I don't know what, there must have been some sort of machinery in here. I mentioned a little flat cars. This is one of two. This guy is 14 feet long. This was number six. I don't know how, how many of these they had, probably 20 or so, uh, and just sequentially numbered. Pedestal trucks, just two axles. And this is uh, built with four longitudinal beams, and uh, we'll see some of those later. There's this additional little car here that's, again, about 14 feet long, but it's got a metal frame of pipes. And I'm told that this was used to, to carry satchels of material. They would just load it in here and stack it on here like a, a cart you'd find at the airport. This little guy is intriguing to me because, it's, again, it's a 14-foot flat car, but they've added a tool crib and uh, some storage elements on it and a roof to make it a, a a component of work train or probably uh, used to work on track and that sort of thing. I've built the model of this uh, flat car uh, for one of my MMM cars in uh, 3 16 inch scale. The rascal's about uh, two inches long. It's it's an itty bitty little car. And uh, Jack Hamilton says that it'll qualify for credit if I put it, a, uh, a working brake gear underneath it. Well, we'll see about that. Anyway, uh, there's several variations on this. And so uh, I've got the one started and I may end up building this guy as well. Here's a, a string of cars uh, at the plant and you can see the box cars and then these flat cars, these are the steel framed cars. And uh, in a previous slide, you could have seen a number of barrels on top of these guys. And they had the ends were shaped so that they would uh, uh, wrap around uh, part of a barrel or two barrels in the end. I'm going to share with you a number of uh, shots of the plant, which describes uh, to you the uh, the array of buildings, all of them were very low, simple frame structures uh, used for a variety of uh, processes. Some were actually part of the manufacturing, others were part of the storage uh, of supplies and that sort of thing. And here's the little 12 tuner. These are the steel framed flat cars with a, a, a piping um, ends, um, which we have uh, replicated in one of the cars that we, that we rebuilt. We'll see that in a bit. Another shot of the trackage uh, gives you an idea of the sharp curves and that sort of thing. A lot of buildings scattered throughout the campus. I know that there is a shot of the little engine house, and I cannot find it in my files, but it's a similar, similar to a one-stall engine house with a little uh, clear story for uh, ventilation. Again, a number of buildings. These are a corrugated iron uh, sheathing and uh, steel metal roofs. This has got uh, shingles on it. And... Uh, most of them they're painted gray, but this one has a little more personality. So this may, for all I know, have been a lunchroom or something like that. And you see the uh, vents on top, probably a kitchen. Again, uh, an array of buildings and these flat cars that I mentioned. These are the the uh, the steel cars. Some more interesting track work and scenes. If you like to hand lay track, this would make a great module to build. And you could build a pretty interesting little shelf layout using these structures or similar structures and similar track work be kind of fun to build. If I eventually downsize, I may do something like this. Again, coming out the end of the building, a uh, little uh, uh, overhead crane way. Again, some shots amongst the buildings, a lot of wood decking to facilitate the movement of, movement of other vehicles up to the loading and so on. 
This one's interesting because here you see a gas pump or set of gas pumps. Because remember those uh, yellow locomotives, the Brookville's were gas fired. This is up at the top of the canyon. And this is where the track bends out of the plant site and starts to head down toward the water. And I thought this was an interesting shot. It shows the uh, a couple of the guys on the crew and uh, ready to uh, move probably down the canyon. Here's a train set going down the hill and the locomotive running in front of it on the downhill side of the train to help protect it from breaking loose. That would be a big concern. Uh, you got a guy standing here to man the brakes on these cars. This is about a four and a half, five percent grade. The uh, right of way is still intact as a trail. And it's a, a pretty nice little hike. I talked with the, one of the staff there today, and she said that this uh, part of the trail system, which is extensive now throughout the, uh, the complex of the golf course and the adjoining properties and, and the old plant site, uh, that this is one of the more popular hikes. Not going to understand why. It's very, very pretty stream bed here coming to, down to the water. And again, you guys, that looks like a guy sitting here on the flat car. And um, I think uh, a lot of people wonder, well, why they, they, they put a spacer here? You know, well, they probably did that for safety in case this blew up. It would keep the locomotive. No, that's just kidding. Because uh, if one of these torched off, everything would be gone. This is very interesting. This is the, the pier and built similar to the piers at uh, Seattle out at an angle because of these, the sounds gets a little deeper fairly quickly as you get away from the shore. This is the current BNSF main line down the sound down to Olympia and on to Portland. And this is the original narrow gauge trackage coming down there and went underneath this uh, trestle work. This is now a big culvert and uh, all of this is gone, but here's your ocean dock. There's a freighter here. And then here you can see the, enlarge that a little bit if I can. You see the structure here of a overhead craneway and you see the buckets here for handling material up and back and forth from the plant site up above down to the water side and uh, all of the mechanism here. So I, I found this very interesting structure. If somebody wanted to scratch build something, this might be interesting. And you've got the, the uh, structure here to handle the cables uh, as they're coming through and going on up the hill. This is on top of the wharf. And again, uh, uh, find the track work very interesting. They had uh, a couple of turnouts on this to make it easy to move around cars on on uh, the, the pier itself. On a lot of piers, uh, they would actually have filled this in with timbers so that there was just the flangeways visible and it would be easier for people to walk back and forth. But here they elected to keep it pretty simple. And again, you can see the boxes of, uh, of the blasting material uh, here in the uh, in the train set. There's the uh, the Great Northern or BNSF trackage up here. Black and white shot, and they had their own little navy, Dupont. And then this is the uh, culvert underneath that Burlington Northern right away. Uh, which used to be the trestle work here. And this is one of the few segments of original track still visible. When uh, Fred Hamilton and I were down there originally, as I was been about uh, nine, 10 years ago, with the uh, Olympia guys, the uh, used to have get togethers at various locations. They had a picnic down here, and that's how I became aware of it. The track work extended uh, beyond this point and out toward the water 
uh, but quite a bit of it had been removed. And subsequent to that, the embankment out to the dock has uh, eroded again, and so less of it's still there. The ocean dock is obviously all gone. And here's the track work that existed when Fred and I were out there. What's interesting, it's just 30 pound rail, which is fairly, very small. But you notice this rail has tie plates. It's the only narrow gauge railroad that I'm aware of in the US where they actually had tie plates on it. Uh, the Rio Grande and, and the RGS and Colorado Southern, as far as I know, did not use tie plates. They just put the, the rail on the raw timbers. Uh, these were there uh, when we were down there, but the, the turnouts connecting these tracks uh, were uh, intact, except that the frog was removed and the points were removed. And so uh, wouldn't be able to uh, rebuild the track work without finding some special uh, source of materials. Again, a shot on the pier. So I mentioned the uh, Corps of Engineers helped them build the uh, museum display area, and here's where they're laying track. This is on the old trackage right away that came in on the Great the uh, Northern Pacific, and this is the end that goes out to I-5. And so here they have a a length of track, the display building right here and a passing or a beginning of a passing track. Weyhaus are paid for uh, erection of this uh, structure to protect the equipment from heavy snow and rain. Done a pretty good job. And subsequent to this, uh, they've built a, a sidewalk out here for, for viewing with uh, old fashioned streetlights there. Very, very nice. Uh, uh, area for public view and then picnic grounds and that sort of thing. But this is that flat, uh, that boxcar that we're talking about rebuilding. And the two end platforms are pretty bad shape. And uh, Jim Sable and I crawled all over it and under it. And we've got pretty good drawings that Jim's made of this car with the structural members underneath and the um, dimensions of the platform and so on. Um, this car, I think, could be relatively easily rebuilt. Uh, what we envision is taking the siding here, loosening it along the side here, putting beams underneath the door open here, and ch with chains and winches, lifting the whole structure up and supporting by the, uh, the beams or the trusses of this structure. This, this structure then would just lift off of the flat car frame. And we'd roll this out of the way and rebuild this, the frame itself. The, these are nominally eight inch by eight inch beams that run the length of the car, some 20 feet. And there are four of them. And so we would uh, get somebody to uh, uh, provide for us um, the timbers necessary to that dimension. And uh, we could rebuild this with uh, it's very, very straightforward mortise and tenon uh, joinery. There are tie rods that go laterally across the car to uh, connect them all together. Very simple bolster structure and so on. So if we can find some guys in the Olympia, DuPont, Tacoma area that want to take on a woodworking project of size, um, we've got all of the elements necessary to make that happen. The museum actually has funds available that one of the fellows down there helped raise many, many years ago. Here's a little detail shot of the end platform. And you can see the, the end beams here. These are pretty well rotted away. Um, and again, with all of the, the metal is available or uh, is there. And as long as you've got the steel and your dimensions, you can rebuild any of these cars. Again, very, very lightweight trucks. And you can see here the nails into this, the side of the, the flat car structure. And these are boards. They're like six inches wide with the beading to make them look like one by threes.
mentioned the steel flat car. This is what it looks like when we took the old uh, material off the top of the old decking off. So you've got the steel structure here, cross beams, and these are all welded and bolted together. Um, and then on the inside of this would basically be a C shape. And on the inside of the C shape is a wood piece that's milled with angles here to just nest right inside the inside of that girder, essentially. And it's bolted to the outside. And then this wood structure on both sides is used to anchor the, the uh, flooring of the flat car across this way. And then those are lag bolted down to that wood wood metal, a wood uh, structure. And again, the, uh, the ends are very, very simple piping. Here you can see um, some of the steel uh, rods across at the bolster that tie the thing across laterally. And your decking is very simple. It looks like uh, three by sixes or two, uh, two to two and a half inch uh, thick uh, planking. Here's a car that is, was uh, it, the condition that uh, it came to the museum when the plant was torn down. It's the same car we rebuilt, but it, over the years it badly deteriorated. So I've got a couple of shots of some of us working. Uh, there are not too many shots of me in them working because I was the guy with the camera most of the time. I actually did work on these. That's me. Um, and Jim Sable and, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name, the other guy. And uh, uh, one of the city guys, Fred, uh, uh, we worked on this thing over a period of like seven weekends one summer and completely rebuilt this guy and the little uh, 16 or 14 footer. These are the beams that I cut at Snoqualmie and tapered them so that they would fit up inside the, uh, the steel structure here. Here you get an idea of us putting it together you see the rivets here and the cross beams. And so we had to notch out so that the rivets would nest inside there and let this board or plank lay down flat. And here it's starting to get finally put together. Notice in this case, the trucks are a little different. These are not the arch bars, but this is about as simple as you can get. And here it is all finished. We, uh, we uh, put a really nice sealant and finish on it and uh, turned it into essentially a dance floor. And here's the locomotive with the flat car in service. Now, the neat thing is we've got about uh, uh, 250 feet of trackage, and that's it. Um, this is the... Uh, the uh, side track and then the the main line is on the other side and we'd cross this road which goes into the shops and the trail would go on down toward uh, the main old main plant site and then all eventually down to uh, to the waterfront and this is just an example of the connection between the locomotive and the flat car This is the 14 footer when we got it. And as you can see, it's uh, in need of some attention. So um, the nice thing was both ends of the car were pretty well deteriorated, but fortunately in a combination of this side and this side, there was enough information from each end of these beams 
and then a, a common place across where they, we could actually come up with a credible dimension. So we, re, we drew plans and uh, this is the pedestal. The pedestals are bolted, bolted to this outside beam and we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, but we took those dimensions and uh, we sourced material from uh, the mill. I wanted the Weyerhaeuser Mills in Everett actually I got them delivered down to uh, to the shops where we worked on them to cut them up uh, in a, a, a dimension that would work uh, to reconstruct this car. Again, some details showing the couplers. Um, compared to a standard gauge coupler, this would be an N scale coupler. About you know about 60 70 percent of the real the uh, full size coupler. The neat thing also is that all of the metal for this car still existed. Gives you an idea how it was structured inside. Here is your coupler pocket, and uh, these there's a plate here on this side and a plate here on this side, and when you bolted these two beams together. Uh, it trapped these plates, that, a plate here and a plate here that compressed when the draft gear was either pushed or pulled. And that was the, the mechanism of the draft gear on these cars. Again, some of the detail with the, uh, the location of the bolts, the uh, stirrups on the, on the ends. And this is some shots of us. Uh, we took all of those metal parts um, into the garage there, the shops, and treated them with a material uh, that uh, actually will uh, penetrate the rust and uh, uh, let the rust be easily removed. Uh, and this actually creates a, uh, it's a chemical treatment that turns this iron into a more uh, a version of iron that is more resistant to rust. And there's probably a chemist in the group that would tell us exactly what that is. But it, it looks like soap on here, but it, it really isn't. That's just the uh, residue. Then we cleaned it all off and, and uh, painted them. And when we put them back on, these are part of the pedestals and part of the, the springs inside the, those pedestals. Here again is uh, a typical pedestal and uh, the, the wheel set uh, journal rode up and down inside here. And this is through bolted uh, to, the, uh, to the wood structure. This is that plate, one of the plates that captured the, uh, the coupler, the coupler shank actually. This is the uh, material that we used on the 14 footer. This we built it, worked on it after we had done the first one. So it became a nice uh, handy work platform. And, and these are some of the uh, materials that we we're able to source for the uh, rebuilding of the 14 footer. And here we are working on some of that material. These beams are the beams that came from Weyerhaeuser and um, we had to cut them and shape them with hand tools, which is very interesting. This is yours truly with a what's called a slick, which is a big chisel used in timber framing. And there's Jim Sable with this uh, sawing away on one of those beams. And I think I've got a picture in here of that's be very interesting. But this is the notch in the structure of those beams where the uh, the pedestal fits in this uh, cutout area. And then these, we pre-drilled the holes for the, uh, the bolts that went through. And here we are fitting it together. And we <clears throat> primed and painted these beams so that they would uh, hold up over time. Detail of the finished pedestal. 
all reassembled. And uh, we basically put it back the way it was originally built. An interesting thing about the structure of these cars, these beams on the outside rest on the pedestals and they carry the weight of the car to the rail. The cross beams are bolted to the these uh, longitudinal beams. And then there are two beams down the center of the car and they are through bolted and suspended from the cross beams. So the center of the car is not riding directly on the trucks. They're suspended and carried over to the side beams. And that's how the weight is distributed and carried. Those two center beams then actually form the uh, mechanism for capturing the couplers at each end. And here you can see them put together. These are the cross members and they're through bolted here. So these are basically floating, suspended only by these cross beams. I think that's Roger Knowlton underneath there, uh, was more part of the crew. And there's Roger. And here we are putting the longitudinal planking on this guy. These are some shots of the underbody of, a, of one of the cars. There was a second one over at Fort Lewis at the Fort Lewis Museum. And uh, our intent is to actually have that one brought over to the museum uh, sometime probably this summer. The Fort Lewis Museum is got, was going through a major renovation. It was closed for like four years or so while we were down here working on this. But we had access to the uh, to the storage behind that museum. But this shows these very simple structure, these bolts and and uh, uh, steel members suspend the cross beam here for the the brakes, and you can see how these and the mechanism pull these in against the truck or the the, the tread of the wheel, and that's how these old outside beam. Uh, brakes worked. And this is the part that I've got to uh, to finish to uh, to please Jack Hamilton. And here's the 14 footer all finished up and ready for the parade. And so we ran it out on the the track and back and forth and had a pretty good time with it. And here's the uh, shot of the track as it, is, as it exists. This is another interesting feature, this very simple little switch mechanism. And this is a lever that pivots here. And then this spring holds it in either position, whether it's on this side or over here, it would hold it in position. Very, very simple structure. And there are several of those that we have uh, uh, available. I don't think I've got it in this set of shots, but the frog here is a 30 pound rail frog. Very rare to find. Well, Don Morenzi, who is uh, one of the key guys down at the Carter Car Museum in California, found one for me. And we came up to, uh, to Tacoma for one of our get together sound rails or so several years ago. And he brought the rascal up in the back of his truck. And it's, uh, on the grounds here underneath that storage uh, structure where the cars are, are kept and it's just laying on the ground in between. This is the inside of the diesel locomotive and uh, Fred, uh, the, uh, the city guy, completely rewired it. And you can see it's the tangle of spaghetti. And uh, according to Carol down at the museum today, uh, they've got uh, a professional team of diesel guys coming out to completely redo this. And so it'll be top notch, fully operational. Uh, right now, Fred is uh, the only guy that runs it and knows how to get it started. Uh, but when he's when they're done, uh, they'll be able to operate it uh, by the book. Then the other thing is this guy needs some cosmetics. There's some rust and so on that needs to get chipped out and sanded away and then 
reprimed and uh, rebuilt. So here it is inside the storage building, all ready to go. I've got a lot of video, but the video doesn't really show very well on Zoom. Uh, but the city is very proud of this. And so the uh, after we uh, finished it up uh, at the end of the season, uh, the mayor and several of the people, including a state representative who helped uh, do an awful lot of uh, support work and fundraising for it, they were all very proud to stand on those flat cars and get towed back and forth on that trackage. The only thing we didn't have was a band. So that's my story. DuPont exists. It's uh, going to be open this summer, and uh, they're open four days a week from like 10 to 4. And um, I encourage everybody to go down. It's well run, well organized. Uh, it's right off I-5. It's at the, the two exits into DuPont. This is the north exit that goes into the old town of DuPont. Uh, with the old company housing and so on. And the staff there is very, very good, very, very friendly. And I encourage you to go down. And if you have any interest at all in getting involved uh, with anything down there, let me know. I spent a lot of time on the road going back and forth to DuPont, but it's 50 miles each way. And uh, so it, it, you know, it's a big part of your day to get back and forth. I'd like to get a couple of guys uh, in the DuPont, uh, Olympia, Tacoma area to head this up and it would be well worth doing. Okay, any questions? Oh, very good, Russ. I noticed that the locomotives are yellow and they look like they have a, a warehouser tree on them. Yes, it does, it has the warehouser uh, logo on it. They didn't change them back to DuPont. No, no, but it's one of those accidents of history that uh, unintended consequences of buying it and then not being able to use it and having the good common sense to salvage some of it. And so here we have it. This is the only uh, active narrow gauge in the States, as far as I know, uh, if you can call it active. Back in the mid 70s, I worked for CIL Explosives in Calgary, Alberta and Nobel, Ontario. Ah. And uh, the nitroglycerin plant was one of the areas I looked after as long as ammonia nitrate plants and acid plant. It's, it's interesting that I don't know if you're aware of that you probably are, is they make their own um, nitroglycerin there, I presume. Because right. You can't transport it. Well, and I, I know what uh, all the plants I've worked at, everything had to be spark free. So it had to be no clothing. You had to, you could wear wool or you had stuff had to be wood. Yeah. Now, you obviously know quite a bit about this. I've read up on my nitroglycerin and so on. They moved nitroglycerin amongst the buildings in wooden troughs. Yeah. Out in the open. I, I couldn't believe that. So how do you they, deal with they actually, weather? They, they, le they just let, left it open. That, that's quite unusual, yeah. Uh, that's you know, it's very, very interesting. And, Usually uh, what they have, they'll have the raw material buildings separate. That's why there's so many buildings and they're separated for safety, basically. Oh, yeah. And so they're separated. So they have to use the narrow gauge rail and take the raw materials to the mix plant, basically, is what they call it. Yeah. And then they would load, load the shells out from there. What was the length of track that they're operating on? They have about uh, the one straight track is about 200, 220 feet long, and then a turnout in the middle of it, and then another segment out toward the end. So I'd say it's probably 300 feet or so of track. The other thing is they have uh, enough rail to build probably half a mile of track. And that rail is stored in the, in the weeds outside their shop building uh, so that somebody won't cart it off. And uh, actually underneath the train set in this storage building or this uh, shelter building, are, uh, there's probably two or 300 tie plates that we uh, found and, and uh, and uh, stored there. So, Russ, are there any plans to extend the trackage? There's been some chatter about it, but it would take actually some guys who would be dedicated to doing that and operating it on some basis to justify it to the city. For this, where this track comes out of the building and goes past the shops, 
you'd have to elevate the uh, the driveway to cross the track. It's about a, a 30 inch elevation difference, but there's plenty of room to make that a, a grade that's easy for uh, vehicles to go across. And like uh, the Fred Foreman, the, uh, who is the guy in charge of city facilities is the guy that rebuilt the, mo the, lo the locomotive and all that here is very interested in, in making this uh, fully functional and keeping it that way. Very fortunate to have him. He's extremely well liked in the city and and has been there a long time. So, are they are they running the uh, train at all uh, on right special now? occasion on special occasions? Yeah. So I'm going to uh, I'm sure they'll run it for us on the narrow gauge convention if we'll organize a day to go down uh, for a couple hours. We're working on those outside tours right now. But there's not much available in the area for active railway uh, activity. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun to have as a as a day trip. But this would make a nifty little layout if somebody wanted to scratch build stuff and build a small ON30 HO layout even using standard gauge, but ON30 with the uh, use a critter. There's all kinds of little uh, mechanisms that you could modify. Could build the top side of this guy out of styrene, and uh, have a very interesting little layout. A lot of switching. 